Chapter 22 The body of a dead woman who in life had been Louise Bourget lay on the floor of her cabin. The two men bent over it. Ray straightened himself first. Been dead close to on an hour, I should say. We'll get Besner onto it. Stabbed to the heart. Death pretty well instantaneous, I should imagine. She doesn't look pretty, does she? No. Poirot shook his head with a slight shudder. The dark feline face was convulsed as though with surprise and fury, the lips drawn back from the teeth. Poirot bent again gently and picked up the right hand. Something just showed within the fingers. He detached it and held it out to race. A little sliver of flimsy paper colored on a pale, mobbish pink. You'll see what it is? Money, said Race. On the corner of a thousand franc note, I fancy. Well, it's clear what happened, said Race. She knew something, and she was blackmailing the murderer with her knowledge. We thought she wasn't being quite straight this morning. Poirot cried out. We have been idiots, fools. We should have known then. What did she say? What could I have seen or heard? I was on the deck below. Naturally, if I had been unable to sleep, if I had mounted the stairs, then perhaps I might have seen this assassin, this monster, enter or leave Madame's cabin. But as it is, of course, that is what did happen. She did come up. She did see someone going to Len and Doyle's cabin, coming out of it. And because of her greed, her insensate greed, she lies here. And we are no nearer to knowing who killed her, finished Race disgustedly. Poirot shook his head. No, no, we know much more now. We know, we know almost everything. Only what we know seems incredible, yet it must be so. Only I do not see. Ah, what a fool I was this morning. We felt, both of us felt that she was keeping something back, and yet we never realized the logical reason. Blackmail! She must have demanded hush money straight away, said Race. Demanded it with threats. The murderer was forced to accede to that request and paid her in French notes. Anything there? Poirot shook his head thoughtfully. I hardly think so. Many people take a reserve of money with them in traveling. Sometimes five pound notes, sometimes dollars, but very often French notes as well. Possibly the murderer paid her all he had in a mixture of currencies. Let us continue our reconstruction. The murderer comes to her cabin and gives her the money, and then... And then, says Paul, she counts it. Oh, yes, I know that glass. She would count the money, and while she counted it, she was completely off her guard. The murderer struck. Having done so successfully, he gathered up the money and fled not noticing that the corner of one of the notes was torn. We may get him that way, said Race doubtfully. I doubt it, said Poirot. He will examine those notes and will probably notice the tear. Of course, if he were a parsimonious disposition, he would not be able to bring himself to destroy a merely note. But I fear, I very much fear, that his temperament is just the opposite. How do you make that out? In both this crime and the murder of Mrs. Doyle demanded certain qualities. Courage, audacity, bold execution, lightning action. Those qualities do not accord with a saving, prudent disposition. Ray shook his head sadly. I'd better get Besner down. The stout doctor's examination did not take long. Accompanied by a good many achs and sos, he went to work. She has been dead not more than an hour, he announced. Death, it was very quick, at once. And what weapon do you think was used? Ah, it is interesting that it was something very sharp, very thin, very delicate. I could show you the kind of thing. Back again in his cabin, he opened a case and extracted a long, delicate surgical knife. It was something like that, my friend. It was not a common table knife. I suppose, said Ray smoothly, 
that none of your own knives are missing, Doctor? Besner stared at him. Then his face grew red with indignation. What is that you say? Do you think I, Karl Besner, who is so well known as all over Austria, I, with my clinics, my highly born patients, I have killed the miserable little of M. de Jamba? Ah, but it is ridiculous, absurd what you say. None of my knives are missing, not one. I tell you, they are all here, correct, in their places. You can see for yourself, and this insult to my profession I will not forget. Dr. Besner closed his case with a snap, flung it down, and stamped out onto the deck. Oh, you put the old boys back up, said Simon. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. It is regrettable. They're on the wrong tack. Old Besner's none one of the best, even though he's a kind of Bosch. Dr. Besner reappeared suddenly. Will you be so kind now as to leave my cabin? I have to do the dressing of my patient's leg. Miss Bowers had entered with him and stood, brisk and professional, waiting for the others to go. Race and Poirot crept out meekly. Race muttered something and went off. Poirot turned to his left. He heard scraps of girlish conversation. A little laugh. Jacqueline and Rosalie were together in the latter's cabin. The door was open and the two girls were standing near it. As his shadow fell on them, they looked up. He saw Rosalie Otterborn smile at him for the first time. A shy, welcoming smile, a little uncertain in its lines, as of one who does a new and unfamiliar thing. You talk to scandal, mademoiselle, he accused them. No, indeed, said Rosalie. As a matter of fact, we were just comparing lipsticks. Poirot smiled. Les chauvons d'aujourd'hui, he murmured. But there was something a little mechanical about his smile, and Jacqueline de Belfort, quicker and more observant than Rosalie, saw it. She dropped the lipstick she was holding and came out upon the deck. And something. What has happened now? It is as you guessed, mademoiselle, something has happened. What? Rosalie came out too. Another death, said Poirot. Rosalie caught her breath sharply. Poirot was watching her narrowly. He saw alarm and something more. Consternation show for a minute or two in her eyes. Mrs. Doyle's maid has been killed, he said bluntly. Killed? cried Jacqueline. Killed, do you say? Yes, that is what I said. Though his answer was nominally to her, it was Rosalie whom he watched. It was to Rosalie to whom he spoke as he went on. You see, this maid, she saw something she was not intended to see, and so she was silenced in case she should not hold her tongue. What was it she saw? Again it was Jacqueline who asked, and again Poirot's answer was to Rosalie. It was an odd little three-cornered scene. There is, I think, very little doubt what it was she saw, said Poro. She saw someone enter and leave Lynette Doyle's cabin on that fatal night. His ears were quick. He heard the sharp intake of breath and saw the eyelids flicker. Rosalie Otterborn had reacted just as he had intended she should. Did she say who it was she saw? Rosalie asked. Gently, regretfully, Poro shook his head. Footsteps pattered up the deck. It was Cordelia Robson, her eyes wide and startled. Oh, Jacqueline, she cried. Something awful has happened. Another dreadful thing. Jacqueline turned to her. The two moved a few steps forward. Almost unconsciously, Poirot and Rosalie Otterborn moved in the other direction. Rosalie said sharply, Why do you look at me? What have you got in your mind? That is two questions you ask me. I will ask you only one in return. Why do you not tell me all the truth, mademoiselle? I don't know what you mean. I told you everything this morning. No, there were things you did not tell me. You did not tell me that you carry about in your handbag a small caliber pistol with a pearl handle. You did not tell me all that you saw last night. She flushed. Then she said sharply, 
quite untrue. I haven't got a revolver. I did not say a revolver. I said a smoke pistol that you carry about in your handbag. She whirled round, darted into her cabin and out again, and thrust her gray leather handbag into his hands. You're talking nonsense. Look for herself, if you like. Porto opened the bag. There was no pistol inside. He handed the bag back to her, meeting her scornful, triumphant glance. No, he said pleasantly. It is not there. You see, you're not always right, Monsieur Poirot, and you're wrong about that other ridiculous thing you said. No, I do not think so. You're infuriating, she stamped an angry foot. You get an idea into your head, and you go on and on and on about it. Because I want you to tell the truth. What is the truth? You seem to know it better than I do. Poirot said, you want me to tell you what it was you saw? If I am right, will you admit that I am right? I will tell you my little idea. I think that when you came around the stern of the boat, you stopped involuntarily because you saw a man come out of a cabin about halfway down the deck. Lynette Doyle's cabin, as you realize next day. You saw him come out, close the door behind him, and walk away from you down the deck, and perhaps enter one of the two end cabins. Now then, am I right, mademoiselle? She did not answer, Poirot said. Perhaps you think it wiser not to speak. Perhaps you are afraid that if you do, you too will be killed. For a moment he thought she had risen to the easy bait, that the accusation against her courage would succeed where more subtle arguments would have failed. Her lips opened, trembled, then... I saw no one, said Rosalie Otterborn. Chapter 23 Miss Bowers came out of Dr. Besner's cabin, smoothing her cuffs over her wrists. Jacqueline left Cornelia abruptly and accosted the hospital nurse. How is he? she demanded. Poirot came up in time to hear the answer. Miss Bowers was looking rather worried. Things aren't going too badly, she said. Jacqueline cried. You mean he's worse? Well, I must say I shall be relieved when we get in and can get a proper x-ray done and the whole thing cleaned up under an anesthetic. When do you think we shall get to Shalalm, mon Poirot? Tomorrow morning. Miss Bowers pursed her lips and shook her head. It's very unfortunate. We're doing all we can, but there's always such a danger of septicemia. Jacqueline caught Miss Bowers' arm and shook it. Is he going to die? Is he going to die? Dear me, no, Mr. Belfort. That is, I hope not, I'm sure. The wound in itself isn't dangerous, but there's no doubt it ought to be x-rayed as soon as possible. And then, of course, poor Mr. Doyle ought to have been kept absolutely quiet today. He's had far too much worry and excitement. No wonder his temperature is rising. What with the shock of his wife's death and one thing and another, Jacqueline relinquished her grasp of the nurse's arm and turned away. She stood leaning over her the side, her back to the other two. Well, what I say is we've got to hope for the best, always, said Miss Bowers. Of course, Mr. Doyle has a very strong constitution. One can see that. Probably never had a day's illness in his life, so that's in his favor. But there's no denying that this rise in temperature is a nasty sign. She shook her head, adjusted her cuffs once more and moved briskly away. Jacqueline turned and walked gropingly, blinded by tears towards her cabin. A hand below her elbow steadied and guided her. She looked up through the tears to find Poirot by her side. She leaned on him a little, and he guided her through the cabin door. She sank down on the bed, and the tears came more freely punctuated by great, shuddering sobs. He'll die. He'll die. I know he'll die. And I shall have killed him. Yes, I shall have killed him. Otto shrugged his shoulders. He shook his head a little sadly. Mademoiselle, what is done is done. One cannot take back the accomplished action. It is too late to regret. She cried out more vehemently. I shall have killed him. And I love him so. Love him so. Otto sighed. Too much. 
It had been his thought long ago in the restaurant of Bonjour Blondin. It was his thought again now. He said, hesitating a little, Do not at all events go by what Miss Bowers says. Hospital nurses. Me, I find them always gloomy. The night nurse, always she is astonished to find her patient alive in the evening. The day nurse, always she is surprised to find him alive in the morning. They know too much, you see, of the possibilities that may arise. When one is motoring, one might easily say to oneself, if a car came out from that crossroad, or if that lorry backed suddenly, or if the wheel came off the car that is approaching me, if a dog jumped off the hedge onto my driving arm, maybe an... I should probably be killed, but one assumes, and usually rightly, that none of these things will happen, and that one will get to one's journey's end. But if, of course, one has been in an accident, or seen one or two accidents, then one is inclined to take the opposite point of view. Jacqueline said, half smiling through her tears, Are you trying to console me, Monsieur Poirot? The bon Dieu knows what I am trying to do. You should not have come on this journey. No, I wish I hadn't. It's been so awful. But it will be soon over now. May we? May we. And Simon will go to the hospital and will get the proper treatment and everything will be all right. You speak like the child, and they lived happily ever afterwards. That is it, is it not? She flushed, suddenly scarlet. Monsieur Poirot, I never meant. Never. It is too soon to think of such a thing. That is the proper hypocritical thing to say, is it not? But you are partly a Latin, Mademoiselle Jacqueline. You should be able to admit facts, even if they do not sound very decorous. Le Roy is mort. Vive le Roy. The sun has gone and the moon rises. That is so, is it not? don't understand. He's just sorry for me. Awfully sorry for me, because he knows how terrible it is for me. I've hurt him so badly. Ah, well, said Poirot, the pure pity. It is a very lofty sentiment. He looked at her half mockingly, half with some other emotion. He murmured softly under his breath words in French. La vie est belle, un peu de mot, un peu de heart, et puis bonjour. La vie est belle, un peu d'espoir, un peu de rêve, et puis bonsoir. He went out again onto the deck. Colonel Race was striding along the deck, and hailed him at once. Poirot, good man, I warned you, I've got an idea. Thrusting his arm through Poirot's, he walked him up the deck. Just a chance remark of Doyle's, I hardly noticed at the time. Something about a telegram. Tien, c'est vrai? Nothing in it, perhaps, but one can't leave any avenue unexplored. Damn it all, man, two murders, and we're still in the dark. Poirot shook his head. No, not in the dark. In the light. Grace looked at him curiously. You have an idea? It's more than an idea now. I am sure. Since when? Since the death of the maid, Louise Bourget. Damned if I see it. My friend, it is so clear. So clear. Only there are difficulties, embarrassments, impediments. See, you around the person like Lynette Doyle, there is so much, so many conflicting hates and jealousies and envies and meannesses. It is like a cloud of flies, buzzing, buzzing. But you think you know? The other looked at him curiously. You wouldn't say so unless you were sure. I can't say I have any real light myself. I have suspicions, of course. Poirot stopped. He laid an impressive hand on Race's arm. You are a great man, mon colonel. You do not say, tell me. What is it that you think? You know that if I could speak now, I would. But there is much to be cleared away first. But think, think for a moment about the lines that I shall indicate. There are certain points. 
There is the statement of Mademoiselle de Belfort that someone overheard our conversation that night in the garden at the Swan. There is the statement of Mr. de Mellerton as to what he heard and did not on the night of the crime. There are Louise Bourget's significant answers to our questions this morning. There is the fact that Mrs. Allerton drinks water, that her son drinks whiskey and soda, and that I drink wine. Add to the fact of two bottles of nail polish and the proverb I quoted. And finally we come to the crux of the whole business, the fact that the pistol was wrapped up in a cheap handkerchief of the velvet stole and thrown overboard. Grace was silent a minute or two, then he shook his head. No, he said. I don't see it. Mind, I've got a faint idea what you're driving at, but as far as I can see, it doesn't work. But yeah. But yes, you are seeing only half the truth. And remember this. We must start again from the beginning, since our first conception was entirely wrong. Race made a slight grimace. I'm used to that. It often seems to me that's all detective work is. Wiping out your false starts and starting again. Yes, it is very true that. And it is just what some people will not do. They conceive a certain theory, and everything has to fit into that theory. If one little fact will not fit, they throw it aside. But it is always the facts that will not fit in that are significant. All along I have realized the significance of that pistol being removed from the scene of the crime. I knew that it meant something, but what that something was, I only realized one little half hour ago. And I still don't see it. But you will. Only your effect along the lines I indicated. And now let us clear up this matter of a telegram. That is, if the uh, doctor will admit us. And Dr. Pesner was still in a very bad humor. In answer to their knock, he disclosed a scowling face. What is it? Once more do you wish to see my patient? But I tell you it is not wise. He has fever. He has had more than enough excitement today. Just one question said Race. Nothing more, I assure you. With an unwilling grunt, the doctor moved aside and the two men entered the cabin. Dr. Besner, growling to himself, pushed past them. I'll return in three minutes, he said, and then positively you go. They heard him stumping down the deck. Simon Doyle looked from one to the other of them inquiringly. Yes, he said. What is it? A very little thing said Race. Just now, when the stewards were reporting to me, they mentioned that Signor Chetty had been particularly troublesome. You said that that didn't surprise you, as you knew he had a bad temper, and that he'd been rude to your wife over some matter of a telegram. Now, can you tell me about that incident? Easily. It was at Wadi Alpha. We'd just come back from the second cataract. Lynette thought she saw a telegram for her sticking up on the board. She'd forgotten, you see, that she wasn't called Ridgeway any longer. Rachetti and Ridgeway do look rather alike when written in an atrocious handwriting. So she tore it open and couldn't make head or tail of it, and was puzzling over it when this fellow Rachetti came along, fairly tore it out of her hand, and gibbered with rage. She went after him to apologize, and he was frightfully rude to her about it. Raised her a deep breath. And you know it all, Mr. Doyle, what was in that telegram? Yes, Lynette read part of it out aloud. It said... He paused... There was a commotion outside. A high-pitched voice was rapidly approaching. Where, Monjou Poirot and Colonel Race? I must see them immediately. It is most important. I have vital information. I are they with Mr. Doyle? Besner had not closed the door. Although the curtain hung across the open doorway, Mrs. Otterborn swept it to one side and entered like a tornado. Her face was suffused with color, her gait slightly unsteady, her command of words not quite under control. Mr. Doyle, she said dramatically, I know who killed your wife. What? Simon stared at her. So did the other two. Mrs. Otterborn swept all three of them with a triumphant glance. She was happy, superbly happy. Yes, she said, my theories are completely vindicated. The deep primeval primordial urges, it may appear impossible, fantastic, but it is the truth. Ray said sharply. Do I understand that you have evidence in your possession to show who killed Mrs. Doyle? 
Mrs. Otterborn sat down in a chair and leaned forward, nodding her head vigorously. Certainly I have. You will agree, will you not, that whoever killed Louise Bourget also killed Annette Doyle, that the two crimes were committed by one and the same hand? Yes, yes, said Simon impatiently. Of course, that stands to reason. Go on. And my assertion holds. I know who killed Louise Bourget, therefore I know who killed Lynette Doyle. You mean you have a theory as to who killed Louise Bourget? suggested Ray skeptically. Mrs. Otterborn turned on him like a tiger. No, I have exact knowledge. I saw the person with my own eyes. Simon, fevered, shouted out, For God's sake, start at the beginning. You know the person who killed Louise Bourget, you say? Mrs. Otterborn nodded. I will tell you exactly what occurred. Yes, she was very happy, no doubt about it. This was her moment, her triumph. What of it, if her books were failing to sell? It's the stupid public that once had brought them and devoured them voraciously, now turned to newer favorites. Salome Otterborn would once again be notorious. Her name would be in all the papers. She would be principal witness for the prosecution at the trial. She took a deep breath and opened her mouth. It was when I went down to lunch. I hardly felt like eating. All the horror of the recent tragedy. Well, I needn't go into that. Halfway down, I remembered that I had uh, left something in my cabin. I told Rosalie to go on without me. She did. Mrs. Otterborn paused a minute. The curtain across the door moved slightly, as though lifted by the wind, but none of the three men noticed it. Ah, her. Mrs. Otterborn paused. Thin ice to skate over here, but it must be done somehow. I had an arrangement with one of the personnel of the ship. He was to get me something I needed, but I did not wish my daughter to know of it. She is inclined to be tiresome in certain ways. Not too good, this, but she could think of something that sounded better before it came to telling the story in court. Grace's eyebrows lifted as his eyes asked a question of Poirot. Poirot gave an infinitesimal nod. His lips formed the word, drink. The curtain across the door moved again. Between it and the door itself, something showed with a faint steel-blue gleam. Mrs. Otterborn continued. The arrangement was that I should go around to the stern on the deck below this, and there I should find the man waiting for me. As I went along the deck, a certain cabin door opened and somebody looked out. It was this girl, Louise Bourget, or whatever her name is. She seemed to be expecting someone. When she saw it was me, she looked disappointed and went abruptly inside again. I didn't think anything of it, of course. I went along just as I had said I would, and got the stuff from the man. I paid him and just had a word with him. Then I started back. Just as I came around the corner, I saw someone knock at the maid's door and go into the cabin. Ray said, And that person was... Bang! The noise of the explosion filled the cabin. There was an acrid, sour smell of smoke. Mrs. Otterborn turned slowly sideways, as though in supreme inquiry. Then her body slumped forward, and she fell to the ground with a crash. From just behind her ear, the blood flowed from a round and neat hole. There was a moment's stupefied silence. Then both the able-bodied men jumped to their feet. The woman's body hindered their movements a little, Grace bent over her while Poirot made a cat-like jump for the door in the deck. The deck was empty. On the ground just in front of the sill lay a big Colt revolver. Poirot glanced in both directions. The deck was empty. He then sprinted towards the stern. As he rounded the corner, he ran into Tim Allerton, who was coming full tilt from the opposite direction. "'What the devil was that?' cried Tim breathlessly. Poirot said sharply, "'Did you meet anyone on your way here?' Meet anyone? No. Then come with me. 
He took the young man by the arm and retraced his steps. A little crowd had assembled by now. Rosalie, Jacqueline, and Cornelia had rushed out of their cabins. More people were coming along the deck from the saloon. Ferguson, Jim Fanthorpe, and Mrs. Allerton. Grace stood by the revolver. Poirot turned his head and said sharply to Tim Allerton, Got any gloves in your pocket? Tim fumbled. Yes, I have. Poirot seized them from him, put them on, and bent to examine the revolver. Grace did the same. The others watched breathlessly. Grace said, He didn't go the other way. Van Thorpe and Ferguson were sitting on this deck lounge. They'd have seen him. Poirot responded, And Mr. Allerton would have met him if he'd gone aft. Grace said, pointing to the revolver. Rather fancy we've seen this not so very long ago. Must make sure, though. He knocked on the door of Pennington's cabin. There was no answer. The cabin was empty. Race strode to the right-hand door of the chest and jerked it open. The revolver was gone. Settles that, said Race. Now then, where's Pennington himself? They went out again on deck. Mrs. Arton had joined the group. Poirot moved swiftly over to her. Madame, take Miss Otterborn with you and look after her. Her mother has been... He consulted Race with an eye, and Race nodded. Killed. Dr. Besner came bustling along. Go, Nimmel, what is there now? They made way for him. Race indicated the cabin. Besner went inside. Fine, Pennington, said Race. Any fingerprints on that revolver? None, said Poirot. They found Pennington on the deck below. He was sitting in the little drawing room writing letters. He lifted a handsome, clean-shaven face. Anything new? he asked. Didn't you hear a shot? Why, now you mention it, I believe I did hear a kind of a bang. But I never dreamed. Who's been shot? Mrs. Otterborn. Mrs. Otterborn? Pennington sounded quite astounded. Well, you do surprise me. Mrs. Otterborn. He shook his head. I can't see that at all. He lowered his voice. Strikes me, gentlemen, we've got a homicidal maniac aboard. We ought to organize a defense system. Mr. Pennington, said Race, how long have you been in this room? Oh, let me see, Mr. Pennington gently rubbed his chin. I should say a matter of twenty minutes or so. And you haven't left it? Why, no, certainly not. He looked inquiringly at the two men. You see, Mr. Pennington, Mrs. Otterborn was shot with your revolver. Chapter 24 Mr. Pennington was shocked. Mr. Pennington could hardly believe it. Why, gentlemen, this is a very serious matter, he said. Very serious indeed. Extremely serious for you, Mr. Pennington. For me? Pennington's eyebrows rose in startled surprise. But, my dear sir, I was sitting quietly writing in here when that shot was fired. You have, perhaps, a witness to prove that? Pennington shook his head. Well, I know, I wouldn't say that. But it's clearly impossible that I should have gone to the deck above, shot this poor woman, and why should I shoot her anyway, and come back down again with no one seeing me? There are always plenty of people on the deck lounge this time of day. How do you account for your pistol being used? Well, I'm afraid it may be to blame there. Quite soon after getting aboard, there was a conversation in the saloon one evening. I remember about firearms, and I mentioned then that I always carried a revolver with me when I traveled. Who was there? Well, I can't remember exactly. Most people, I think. Quite a crowd, anyway. He shook his head gently. Why, yes, he said. I am certainly to blame there, he went on. First Lynette, then Lynette's maid, and now Mrs. Otterborn. There seems no reason in it at all. There was reason, said Race. There was? Yes. Mrs. Otterborn was on the point of telling us that she had seen a certain person go to Louise's cabin. Before she could name that person, she was shot dead. Andrew Pennington passed a fine silk handkerchief over his brow. Oh, this is terrible, he murmured. Poirot said, Bonjour, Pennington. I would like to discuss certain aspects of the case with you. 
Will you come to my cabin in half an hour's time? I should be delighted. Pennington did not sound delighted. He did not look delighted either. Race and Poirot exchanged glances and then abruptly left the room. Cunning old devil, said Race. But he's afraid, eh? Poirot nodded. Yes, he is not happy on Mr. Pennington. As they reached the promenade deck again, Mrs. Allerton came out of her cabin, and seeing Poirot beckoned him imperiously. Madame? That poor child. Tell me, Mojo Poirot, is there a double cabin somewhere that I could share with her? She oughtn't to go back to the one she shared with her mother, and mine is only a single one. That can be arranged, madame. It is very good of you. It's mere decency. Besides, I'm very fond of the girl. I've always liked her. Is she very upset? Terribly. She seems to have been absolutely devoted to that odious woman. That is what is so pathetic about it all. Tim says he believes she drank. Is that true? Poirot nodded. Well, poor woman, one mustn't judge her, I suppose. But the girl must have had a terrible life. She did, madame. She is very proud, and she was very loyal. Yes, I like that. Loyalty, I mean. It's out of fashion nowadays. She is an odd character, that girl. Proud, reserved, stubborn, and terribly warm-hearted underneath, I fancy. I see that I have given her into good hands, madame. Yes, don't worry, I'll look after her. She's inclined to cling to me in the most pathetic fashion. Mrs. Allerton went back into the cabin. Poirot returned to the scene of the tragedy. Cornelia was still standing on the deck, her eyes wide. She said, I don't understand, Monsieur Poirot. How did the person who shot her get away without her seeing him? Yes. How? echoed Jacqueline. Ah, said Poirot. It was not quite such a disappearing trick as you think, mademoiselle. There were three distinct ways the murderer might have gone. Jacqueline looked puzzled. She said, Three? He might have gone to the right, or he might have gone to the left. But I don't see any other way, puzzled Cornelia. Jacqueline, too, frowned. Then her brow cleared. She said, Of course. He could move in two directions on one plane, but he could go at right angles to that plane, too. That is, he couldn't go up very well, but he could go down. Poirot smiled. You have brains, mademoiselle, Cornelia said. I know I'm just a plain mutt, but I still don't see. Jacqueline said, Bonjour, Poirot means, darling, that he could swing himself over the rail and down onto the deck below. My! gasped Cornelia. I never thought of that. He'd have to be mighty quick about it, though. I suppose he could just do it. He could do it easily enough, said Tim Arton. Remember, there's always a minute of shock after a thing like this. One hears a shock, and one's too paralyzed to move for a second or two. That was your experience, Mr. Alton? Yes, it was. I just stood like a dummy for quite five seconds. Then I fairly sprinted around the deck. Race came out of Besner's cabin and said authoritatively, Would you mind all clearing off? We want to bring out the body. Everyone moved away obediently. Poirot went with them. Cornelia said to him with sad earnestness, I'll never forget this trip as long as I live. Three deaths. It's just like living in a nightmare. Ferguson overheard her. He said aggressively, That's because you're over-civilized. You should look on death as the Oriental does. It's a mere incident, hardly noticeable, Cornelia said. That's all very well. They're not educated, poor creatures. No, and a good thing, too. Education has devitalized the white races. Look at America goes in for an orgy of culture, simply disgusting. I think you're talking nonsense, said Cornelia, flushing. I attend lectures every winter on Greek art and the Renaissance. 
and I went to some on famous women of history. Mr. Ferguson groaned in agony. Griegard, Renaissance, famous women of history. It makes me quite sick to hear you. It's the future that matters, but not the past. Three women are dead on this boat. Well, what of it? They're no loss. Lynette Doyle and her money, the French maid, domestic parasite. Mrs. Otterborn, a useless fool of a woman. Do you think anyone really cares whether they're dead or not? I don't. I think it's a damn good thing. Then you're wrong, Cornelia blazed out at him. And it makes me sick to hear you talk and talk, as though nobody mattered but you. I didn't like Mrs. Otterborn much, but her daughter was ever so fond of her, and she's all broken up over her mother's death. I don't know much about the French maid, but I expect somebody was fond of her somewhere. And as for Lynette Doyle, well, apart from everything else, she was just lovely. She was so beautiful when she came into her room that it made a lump come into your throat. I'm homely myself, and that makes me appreciate beauty a lot more. She was as beautiful, just as a woman, as anything in Greek art. And when anything's beautiful is dead, it's a loss to the world. So there! Mr. Ferguson stepped back a pace. He caught hold of his hair with both hands and tugged at it vehemently. I give it up. You're unbelievable. Just haven't got a bit of natural female spite in you anywhere. He turned to Poirot. Do you know, sir, that Cornelia's father was practically ruined by Lynette Ridgway's old man? But does the girl gnash her teeth when she sees the heirs sailing about in pearls and Paris models? No, she just bleats out. Isn't she beautiful? Like a blessed Ba Lamb. I don't believe she even felt sore at her. Cornelia flushed. I did. Just for a minute. Papa kind of died of discouragement, you know, because he hadn't made good. Felt sore for a minute, I ask you. Cordelia flashed round on him. Well, didn't you say just now it was the future that mattered, not the past? All that was in the past, wasn't it? It's over. You got me there, said Ferguson. Cornelia Robson, you're the only nice woman I've ever come across. Will you marry me? Don't be absurd. It's a genuine proposal, even if it is made in the presence of old man sleuth. Anyway, you're a witness, Monsieur Poirot. I've deliberately offered marriage to this female against all my principles, because I don't believe in legal contracts between the sexes. But I don't think she'd stand for anything else, so marriage it shall be. Come on, Cornelia. Say yes. I think you're utterly ridiculous, said Cornelia, flushing. Why won't you marry me? You're not serious, said Cornelia. Do you mean not serious in proposing, or do you mean not serious in character? Both. But I really meant character. You laugh at all sorts of serious things. Education and culture. And, and death. You wouldn't be reliable. She broke off, flushed again, and hurried along into her cabin. Ferguson stared after her. Damn the girl. I believe she really means it. She wants a man to be reliable. Reliable, you gods! He paused and then said curiously, What's the matter with you, Monsieur Poirot? You seem very deep in thought. Poirot roused himself with a start. I reflect. That is all. I reflect. A meditation on death. Death the Recurring Decimal by Hercule Poirot. One of his well-known monographs. Mr. Ferguson, said Poirot, you are a very impertinent young man. You must excuse me, I like attacking established institutions. And I am an established institution? Precisely. What do you think of that girl? Of Miss Robson? Yes. I think that she has a great deal of character. You're right. She's got spirit. She looks meek, but she isn't. She's got guts. She's... Oh, damn it, I want that girl. It mightn't be a bad move if I tackled the old lady. If I could once get her thoroughly against me, it might come some ice with Cornelia. He wheeled and went into the observation saloon. Miss Van Schuyler was seated in her usual corner. She looked even more arrogant than usual. She was knitting. Ferguson strode up to her. Hercule Poirot, entering unobtrusively, took a seat a discreet distance away and appeared to be absorbed in a magazine. 
Good afternoon, Miss Van Schuyler. Miss Van Schuyler raised her eyes for a bare second, dropped them again, and murmured frigidly, Er, er good afternoon. Look here, Miss Van Schuyler. I want to talk to you about something pretty important. It's just this. I want to marry your niece. Miss Van Schuyler's ball of wool dropped onto the ground and ran wildly across the saloon. She said in a venomous tone, You must be out of your senses, young man. Not at all. I'm determined to marry her. I've asked her to marry me. Miss Van Schuyler surveyed him coldly, with a kind of speculative interest she might have accorded to an odd sort of beetle. Indeed, and I presume she sent you about your business. She refused me. Naturally. Not naturally at all. I'm going to go on asking her till she agrees. I can assure you, sir, I shall take steps to see that my young cousins not subjected to any such persecution, said Miss Van Schuyler in a biting tone. What have you got against me? Miss Van Schuyler merely raised her eyebrows and gave a vehement tug to her wool, preparatory to regaining it and closing the interview. Come now, persisted Mr. Ferguson, what have you got against me? I should think that was quite obvious, Mr. I don't know your name. Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson, Miss Van Schuyler uttered the name with definite distaste. Any such idea is quite out of the question. You mean that I'm not good enough for her? I should think that would have been obvious to you. In what way am I not good enough? Miss Van Schuyler again did not answer. I've got two legs, two arms, good health, quite reasonable brains. What's wrong with that? There is such a thing as social position, Mr. Ferguson. Social position is bunk. Repeating the sentence due to train. Social position is bunk. The door swung open and Cornelia came in. She stopped dead on seeing her redoubtable cousin Marie in conversation with her would-be suitor. The outrageous Mr. Ferguson turned his head, grinned broadly, and called out, Come along, Cornelia. I'm asking for your hand in marriage in the best conventional manner. Cornelia, said Miss Van Schuyler, and her voice was truly awful in quality, Have you encouraged this young man? Uh, no, of course not. At least, not exactly. I, I mean, what do you mean? She hasn't encouraged me, said Mr. Ferguson helpfully. I've done it all. She hasn't actually pushed me in the face because she's got too kind of a heart. Cornelia, your aunt, says I'm not good enough for you. That, of course, is true, but not in the way she means it. My moral nature certainly doesn't equal yours, but her point is that I'm hopelessly below you socially. That, I think, is equally obvious to Cornelia, said Miss Van Schuyler. Is it? Mr. Ferguson looked at her searchingly. Is that why you won't marry me? No, it isn't, Cornelia flushed. If, if I liked you, I'd marry you no matter who you were. But you don't like me? I, I think you're just outrageous. The way you say things, the things you say. I've never met anyone the least like you. I... Tears threatened to overcome her. She rushed from the room. On the whole, said Mr. Ferguson, that's not too bad for a start. He leaned back in his chair, gazed at the ceiling, whistled, crossed his disreputable knees, and remarked, I'll be calling you auntie yet. Miss Van Schuyler trembled with rage. Leave this room at once, sir, or I'll ring for the steward. I've paid for my ticket, said Mr. Ferguson. They can't possibly turn me out of the public lounge. But I'll humor you, he sang softly. Yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Rising, he sauntered nonchalantly to the door and passed out. Choking with anger, Miss Van Schuyler struggled to her feet. Poirot, discreetly emerging from retirement behind his magazine, sprang up and retrieved the ball of wool. Thank you, Monsieur Poirot. If you would send Miss Bowers to me, I feel quite upset. That insolent young man. Rather eccentric, I'm afraid, said Poirot. 
most of that family are. Spoiled, of course. Always inclined to tilt at windmills, he added carelessly. You recognized him, I suppose? Recognized him? Calls himself Ferguson, and won't use his title because of his advanced ideas. His title? Miss Van Scala's tone was sharp. Yes, that's young Lord Dawlish, rolling in money, of course, but he became a communist when he was at Oxford. Miss Van Schuyler, her face a battleground of contradictory emotions, said, How long have you known this, Mr. Poirot? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. There was a picture in one of these papers. I noticed the resemblance. Then I found a signal ring with a coat of arms on it. Oh, there is no doubt about it, I assure you. He quite enjoyed reading the conflicting expressions that succeeded each other on Miss Van Schuyler's face. Finally, with a gracious inclination of the head, she said, I am very much obliged to you, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot looked after her as she went out of the saloon and smiled. Then he sat down and his face grew grave once more. He was following out a train of thought in his mind. From time to time, he nodded his head. May we? he said at last. It all fits in. Chapter 25 Race found him still sitting there. Well, Poirot, what about it? Penitent's due in ten minutes. I'm leaving this in your hands. Poirot rose quickly to his feet. First, get hold of young Fanthorpe. Fanthorpe? Race looked surprised. Yes, bring him to my cabin. Race nodded and went off. Poirot went along to his cabin. Race arrived with young Fanthorpe a minute or two afterwards. Poirot indicated chairs and offered cigarettes. Namoju Fanthorpe. To our business. I perceive that you wear the same tie that my friend Hastings wears. Jim Fanthorpe looked down at his neckwear with some bewilderment. It's an O.E. tie, he said. Exactly. You must understand that though I am a foreigner, I know something of the English point of view. I know, for instance, that there are things which are done and things which are not done. Jim Fanthorpe grinned. We don't say that sort of thing much nowadays, sir. Perhaps not, but the custom, it still remains. The old school tie is the old school tie, and there are certain things, I know this from experience, that the old school tie does not do. One of those things, Monjou Fanthorpe, is to butt into a private conversation unasked, when one does not know the people who are conducting it. Fanthorpe stared. Poirot went on. But the other day, Monjou Fanthorpe, that is exactly what you did do. Certain persons were quietly transacting some private business in the observation saloon. You strolled near them, obviously in order to overhear what it was that was in progress, and presently you actually turned round and congratulated the lady, Mrs. Simon Doyle, on the soundness of her business methods. Jim Fanthorpe's face got very red. Poirot swept on, not waiting for a comment. Now that, Mujo Fanthorpe, was not at all the behavior of one who wears a tie similar to that worn by my friend Hastings. Hastings is all delicacy, would die of shame before he did such a thing. Therefore, taking that action of yours, in conjunction with the fact that you are a very young man to be able to afford an expensive holiday, that you are a member of a country solicitor's firm, and therefore probably not extravagantly well off, and that you show no sign of a recent illness such as might necessitate a prolonged visit abroad, I ask myself, and am now asking you, what is the reason for your presence on this boat? Jim Fanthorpe jerked his head back. I decline to give you any information, whatever, Monjo Poirot. I really think you must be mad. I am not mad. I am very, very sane. Where is your firm? In Northampton? That is not very far from Wood Hall. What conversation did you try to overhear? One concerning legal documents. What was the object of your remark? A remark which you uttered with obvious embarrassment and malaise. Your object was to prevent Mrs. Doyle from signing any documents under it. He paused. On this boat we have had a murder, 
and following that murder two other murders in rapid succession. If I further give you the information that the weapon which killed Mrs. Otterborn was a revolver owned by Mr. Andrew Pennington, then perhaps you will realize that it is actually your duty to tell us all you can. Jim Fanthorpe was silent for some minutes. At last, he said, You have rather an odd way of going about things, Monsieur Poto, but I appreciate the points you've made. The trouble is that I have no exact information to lay before you. You mean that it is a case merely of suspicion? Yes. And therefore you think it injudicious to speak? That may be true, legally speaking. But this is not a court of law. Colonel Race and myself are endeavoring to track down a murderer. Anything that can help us to do so may be valuable. Again Jim Fanthorpe reflected. Then he said, Very well. What is it that you want to know? Why did you come on this trip? My uncle, Mr. Carmichael, Mrs. Doyle's English solicitor, sent me. He handled a good many of her affairs. In this way, he was often in correspondence with Mr. Andrew Pennington, who was Mrs. Doyle's American trustee. Several small incidents, I cannot enumerate them all, made my uncle suspicious that all was not quite as it should be. In plain language, said Race, your uncle suspected that Pennington was a crook. Jim Fanthorpe nodded, a faint smile on his face. He put it rather more bluntly than I should, but the main idea is correct. Various excuses made by Pennington, certain plausible explanations of the disposal of funds, aroused my uncle's distrust. While these suspicions of his were still nebulous, Mrs. Bridgeway married unexpectedly and went off on her honeymoon to Egypt. Her marriage relieved my uncle's mind, as he knew that on her return to England the estate would have to be formally settled and handed over. However, in a letter she wrote him from Cairo, she mentioned casually that she had unexpectedly run across Andrew Pennington. My uncle's suspicions became acute. He felt sure that Pennington, perhaps by now in a desperate position, was going to try and obtain signatures from her which would cover his own defalcations. Since my uncle had no definite evidence to lay before her, he was in a most difficult position. The only thing he could think of was to send me out there, traveling by air, with instructions to discover what was in the wind. I was to keep my eyes open and act summarily if necessary. A most unpleasant mission, I can assure you. As a matter of fact, on the occasion you mention, I had to behave more or less as a cad. It was awkward, but on the whole I was satisfied with the result. You mean you put Mrs. Doyle on her guard? Not so much that. But I think I put the wind up Pennington. I felt convinced he wouldn't try any more funny business for some time, and by then I hoped to have got intimate enough with Mr. and Mrs. Doyle to convey some kind of a warning. As a matter of fact, I hoped to do so through Doyle. Mrs. Doyle was so attached to Mr. Pennington that it would have been a bit awkward to suggest things to her about him. It would have been easier for me to reproach the husband. Grace nodded. Poirot asked, Will you give me a candid opinion on one point, Monjo Fento? If you were engaged in putting a swindle over, would you choose Mrs. Doyle or Mr. Doyle as a victim? Fanthorpe smiled faintly. Mr. Doyle, every time. Lynette Doyle was very shrewd in business matters. Her husband, I should fancy, is one of those trustful fellows who know nothing of business and are always ready to sign on the dotted line. As he himself put it. I agree, said Poirot. He looked at Race. And there is your motive, Jim Fanthorpe said. But this is all pure conjecture. It isn't evidence, Poirot said easily. <laughs> bah, we will get evidence. How? Possibly for Mr. Pennington himself. Fanthorpe looked doubtful. I wonder. I very much wonder. Race glanced at his watch. He's about due now. Jim Fanthorpe was quick to take the hint. He left them. Two minutes later, Andrew Pennington made his appearance. His manner was all smiling urbanity. Only the taut line of his jaw and the wariness of his eyes betrayed the fact that a thoroughly experienced fighter was on his guard. Well, gentlemen, he said, here I am. He sat down and looked at them inquiringly. We asked you to come here, Mr. Pennington began Poirot, because it is fairly obvious that you have a very special and immediate interest in the case. Pennington raised his eyebrows slightly. 
Is that so? Oro said gently. Surely you have known Lynette Ridgeway, I understand, since she was quite a child. Oh, that. His face altered, became less alert. I beg pardon, I didn't quite get you. Yes, as I told you this morning, I've known Lynette since she was a cute little thing in Pinyforest. You are on terms of close intimacy with her father? Not so. Mellowish Ridgeway and I were close. Very close. You were so intimately associated that on his death he appointed you business guardian to his daughter and trustee to the vast fortune she inherited. Why, roughly, that is so. The wariness was back again. The note was more cautious. I was not the only trustee, naturally. Others were associated with me. Who have since died? Two of them are dead. The other, Mr. Sterndale Rockford, is alive. Your partner? Yes. Miss Ridgeway, I understand, was not yet of age when she married. She would have been twenty-one next July. And in the normal course of events, she would have come into control of her fortune then? Yes. But her marriage precipitated matters. Pennington's jaw hardened. He shot out his chin at them aggressively. You'll pardon me, gentlemen. What exact business is all this of yours? If you dislike answering the question. There's no dislike about it. I don't mind what you ask me. But I don't see the relevance of all this. Oh, but surely, Mr. Pennington. Otto leaned forward, his eyes green and cat-like. There is the question of motive. In considering that, financial considerations must always be taken into account. Pennington said sullenly, by Ridgeway's will, Lynette got control of her dough when she was twenty-one or when she married. No conditions of any kind? No conditions. And it is a matter, I am credibly assured, of millions. Millions it is, Horro said softly. Your responsibility, Mr. Pennington, and that of your partner, has been a very grave one. Pennington said curtly. We're used to responsibility. It doesn't worry us any. I wonder. Something in his tone flicked the other man on the raw. He said angrily, What the devil do you mean? Otto replied with an air of engaging frankness. I was wondering, Mr. Pennington, whether Lynette Ridgeway's sudden marriage caused any consternation in your office. Consternation? That was the word I used. What the hell are you driving at? Something quite simple. Are Lynette Doyle's affairs in the perfect order they should be? Pennington rose to his feet. That's enough. I'm through. He made for the door. But you will answer my question first? Pennington snapped. They're in perfect order. You are not so alarmed when the news of Lynette Doyle's marriage reached you that you rushed over to Europe by the first boat and staged an apparently fortuitous meeting in Egypt. Pennington came back towards them. He had himself at a control once more. What you're saying is absolute balderdash. I didn't even know that Lynette was married till I met her in Cairo. I was utterly astonished. Her letter must have missed me by a day in New York. It was forwarded, and I got it about a week later. You came over by the Carmonic, I think you said. That's right. And the letter reached New York after the Carmonic sailed. How many times have I got to repeat it? It is strange, said Poirot. What's strange? That on your luggage there are no labels of the Carmonic. The only recent labels of transatlantic sailing are the Normandy. The Normandy, I remember, sailed two days after the Carmonic. For a moment, the other was at a loss. His eyes wavered. Colonel Race weighed in with telling effect. Come now, Mr. Pennington. We have several reasons for believing that you came over on the Normandy and not by the Carmanic, as you said. In that case, you received Mrs. Doyle's letter before you left New York. It's no good denying it, for it's the easiest thing in the world to check up on the steamship companies. Andrew Pennington felt absent-mindedly for a chair and sat down. His face was impassive, a poker face. Behind that mask, his agile brain looked ahead to the next move. I'll have to hand it to you, gentlemen. You've been too smart for me, but I had my reasons for acting as I did. No doubt. 
Grace's tone was curt. If I give them to you, I must be understood I do so in confidence. I think you can trust us to behave fittingly. Naturally, I cannot give assurances blindly. Well, Pendant sighed, I'll come clean. There was some monkey business going on in England. It worried me. I couldn't do much about it by letter. The only thing was to come over and see for myself. What do you mean by monkey business? I had good reason to believe that Lynette was being swindled. By whom? Her British lawyer. Now that's not the kind of accusation you can fling around, anyhow. I made up my mind to come over right away and see into matters myself. That does great credit to your vigilance, I'm sure. But why the little inception about not having received the letter? Well, I ask you, Pennington spread out his hands. You can't butt in on a honeymoon couple without more or less coming down to brass tacks and giving your reasons. I thought it best to make the meeting accidental. Besides, I didn't know anything about the husband. He might have been mixed up in the racket for all I knew. In fact, all your actions were actuated by pure disinterestedness, said Colonel Reyes dryly. You have said it, Colonel. And there was a pause. Reyes glanced at Poirot. The little man leant forward. Bonjour, Pennington. We do not believe a word of your story. The hell you don't. And what the hell do you believe? We believe that Lynette Ridgeway's unexpected marriage put you in a financial quandary, that you came over post haste to try and find some way out of the mess you were in, that is to say, some way of gaining time, that with that end in view, you endeavored to obtain Mrs. Doyle's signature to certain documents, and failed, that on the journey up the Nile, when walking along the cliff top at Abu Simbel, you dislodged a boulder which fell and only narrowly, very narrowly missed its object. You're crazy! We believe that the same kind of circumstances occurred on the return journey. That is to say, an opportunity presented itself of putting Mrs. Doyle out of the way at the moment when her death would be almost certainly ascribed to the action of another person. We not only believe, but know that it was your revolver which killed a woman who was about to reveal to us the name of the person whom she had reason to believe killed both Lynette Doyle and the maid Louise. Hell! The forcible ejaculation broke forth and interrupted Poirot's stream of eloquence. What are you getting at? Are you crazy? What motive had I to kill Lynette? I wouldn't get her money. That goes to her husband. Why don't you pick on him? He's the one to benefit, not me, Ray said coldly. Doyle never left the lounge on the night of the tragedy till he was shot at and wounded in the leg. The impossibility of his walking a step after that is attested to by a doctor and a nurse, both independent and reliable witnesses. Simon Doyle could not have killed his wife. He could not have killed Louise Bourget. He most definitely did not kill Mrs. Otterborn. You know that as well as we do. I know he didn't kill her, Pennington sounded a little calmer. All I say is, why pick on me when I don't benefit by her death? But, my dear sir, Poirot's voice came soft as a purring cat. That is rather a matter of opinion. Mrs. Doyle was a keen woman of business, fully conversant of her own affairs, and very quick to spot any irregularity. As soon as she took up the control of a property, which she would have done on her return to England, her suspicions were bound to be aroused. But now that she is dead, and that her husband, as you have just pointed out, inherits, the whole thing is different. Simon Doyle knows nothing whatever of his wife's affairs, except that she was a rich woman. He is of a simple, trusting disposition. He will find it easy to place complicated statements before him to involve the real issue in a net of figures, and to delay settlement with pleas of legal formalities in the recent depression. I think that it makes a very considerable difference to you whether you deal with the husband or the wife. Pennington shrugged his shoulders. Your ideas are fantastic. Time will show. What did you say? I said time will show. This is a matter of three deaths, three murders. The law will demand the most searching investigation of the condition of Mrs. Doyle's estate. He saw the sudden sag in the other's shoulders and knew that he had won. Jim Van Thorpe's suspicions were well founded. Poirot went on. You fled and lost. Useless to go on bluffing. Pennington muttered. You don't understand. It's all square enough, really. 
It's been this damn slump. Wall Street's been crazy, but I had staged to come back. With luck, everything will be okay by the middle of June. With shaking hands, he took a cigarette, tried to light it, failed. I suppose, mused Poirot, that the boulder was a sudden temptation. You thought nobody saw you. That was an accident. I swear it was an accident. The man leaned forward, his face working, his eyes terrified. I stumbled and fell against it. I swear it was an accident. The two men said nothing. Pendleton suddenly pulled himself together. He was still a wreck of a man, but his fighting spirit had returned in a certain measure. He moved towards the door. You can't pin that on me, gentlemen. It was an accident. And it wasn't I who shot her, do you hear? You can't pin that on me either, and you never will. He went out. Chapter 26 As the door closed behind him, Race gave a deep sigh. We got more than I thought we should. Admission of fraud. Admission of attempted murder. Further than that, it's impossible to go. A man will confess more or less to attempted murder, but you won't get him to confess to the real thing. Sometimes it can be done, said Poirot. His eyes were dreamy, cat-like. Race looked at him curiously. Got a plan? Poirot nodded. Then he said, ticking off the items on his fingers, The gardener does one. Mr. Allerton's statement. The two bottles of nail polish. My bottle of wine. The velvet stole. The stained handkerchief. The pistol that was left on the scene of the crime. The death of Louise. The death of Mrs. Otterborn. Yes, it's all there. Pennington didn't do it, Race. What? Race was startled. Pennington didn't do it. He had the motive, yes, but he had the will to do it, yes. He got as far as attempting to do it. Mais c'est tout. Something was wanted for this crime that Pennington hasn't got. This is a crime that needed audacity, swift and faultless execution, courage, indifference to danger, and a resourceful, calculating brain. Pennington hasn't got those attributes. He couldn't do a crime unless he knew it to be safe. This crime wasn't safe. It hung on the razor edge. It needed boldness. Pennington isn't bold, he's only astute. Race looked at him with the respect one able man gives to another. You've got it all well taped, he said. I think so, yes. There are one or two things. That telegram, for instance, that Bennett Doyle had. I should like to get that cleared up. By Jove, we forgot to ask Doyle. He was telling us when poor old Ma Otterborn came along. We'll have to ask him again. Presently. First, I have someone else to whom I wish to speak. Who's that? Tim Mallardon. Race raised his eyebrows. Allerton. Well, we'll get him here. He pressed a bell and sent the steward with a message. Tim Allerton entered with a questioning look. The steward said you wanted to see me. That is right, Mr. Allerton. Sit down. Tim sat. His face was attentive, but very slightly bored. Anything I can do? His tone was polite, but not enthusiastic. Poirot said, In a sense, perhaps. What I really require is for you to listen. Tim's eyebrows rose in polite surprise. Certainly, I'm the world's best listener. Can be relied on to say, Ooh! At the right moments. That is very satisfactory. Ur will be very expressive. Eh bien, let us commence. When I met you and your mother at us one, old Rallerton, I was attracted to your company very strongly. To begin with, I thought your mother was one of the most charming people I had ever met. The weary face flickered for a moment. A shade of expression came into it. She is unique, he said. But the second thing that interested me was your mention of a certain lady. Really? Yes, a Miss Joanna Southwood. You see, I had recently been hearing that name. He paused and went on. For the last three years, there have been certain jewel robberies that have been worrying Scotland Yard a good deal. 
They are what may be described as society robberies. The method is usually the same, the substitution of an imitation piece of jewelry for an original. My friend, Chief Inspector Yop, came to the conclusion that the robberies were not the work of one person, but of two people working in with each other very cleverly. He was convinced, from the considerable inside knowledge displayed, that the robberies were the work of people in a good social position, and finally his attention became riveted on Miss Joanna Southwood. Every one of the victims had been either a friend or acquaintance of hers, and in each case she had either handled or been lent the piece of jewelry in question. Also, her style of living was far in excess of her income. On the other hand, it was quite clear that the actual robbery, that is to say the substitution, had not been accomplished by her. In some cases, she had even been out of England during the period of the jury, must have been replaced. So, gradually, a little picture grew up in Inspector Yap's mind. Miss Southwood was at one time associated with the Guild of Modern Jewelry. He suspected that she handled the jewels in question, made accurate drawings of them, got them copied by some humble but dishonest working jeweler, and that the third part of the operation was a successful substitution by another person, somebody who could have been proved never to have handled the jewels and never to have had anything to do with copies or imitations of precious stones. Of the identity of this other person, Yap was ignorant. Certain things that fell from you in conversation interested me. A ring that had disappeared when you were in Majorca. The fact that you had been in a house party where one of these fake substitutions had occurred. Your close association with Miss Southwood. There was also the fact that you obviously resented my presence and tried to get your mother to be less friendly towards me. That might, of course, have been just personal dislike. But I thought not. You were too anxious to try and hide your distaste under a genial manner. Eh bien, after the murder of Leonard Doyle, it is discovered that her pearls are missing. You comprehend at once, I think of you, but I am not quite satisfied, for if you are working, as I suspect, with Miss Southwood, who was an intimate friend of Mrs. Doyle's, then substitution would be the method employed, not bare-faced theft. But then the pearls quite unexpectedly are returned, and what do I discover? That they are not genuine, but imitation. I know then who the real thief is. It was the imitation string which was stolen and returned, an imitation which you had previously substituted for the real necklace. He looked at the young man in front of him. Tim was white under his tan. He was not so good a fighter as Pennington. His stamina was bad. He said with an effort to sustain his mocking manner, Indeed? And if so, what did I do with them? That I know also. The young man's face changed, broke up. Poirot went on slowly. There is only one place where they can be. I have reflected, and my reason tells me that it is so. Those pearls, Mr. Allerton, are concealed in a rosary that hangs in your cabin. The beads of it are very elaborately carved. I think you had it made specially. Those beads unscrew, though you would never think to look so at them. Inside each is a pearl, struck with secotine. Most police searchers respect religious symbols unless there is something obviously queer about them. You counted on that. I endeavored to find out how Miss Southwood sent the imitation necklace out to you. She must have done so, since you came here from Majorca on hearing that Mrs. Doyle would be here for her honeymoon. My theory is that it was sent in a book, a square hole being cut out of the pages in the middle. A book goes with the ends open, and is practically never opened on the post. There was a pause, a long pause. Then Tim said quietly, Who win? It's been a good game, but it's over at last. There's nothing for it now, I suppose, but to take my medicine. Poirot nodded gently. Do you realize you were seen that night? Seen? Tim started. Yes, on the night that Lynette Doyle died. Someone saw you leave her cabin just after one of the morning. Tim said, Look here, you aren't thinking. It wasn't I who killed her. I'll swear that. I've been in the most awful stew to have chosen that night of all others. God, it's been awful. Poirot said, Yes, you must have had uneasy moments. But now that the truth has come out, you may be able to help us. Was Mrs. Doyle alive or dead when you stole the pearls? 
Tim said hoarsely. I don't know. Honest to God, Monjo Paro, I don't know. I'd found out where she put them that night, on the little table by the bed. I crept in, felt very softly on the table, and grabbed them, put down the others, and crept out again. I assumed, of course, that she was asleep. Did you hear her breathing? Surely you would have listened for that. Tim thought earnestly. It was very still. Very still indeed. Now I can't remember actually hearing her breathe. Was there any smell of smoke lingering in the air, as there would have been if a firearm had been discharged recently? I don't think so. I don't remember it. Poirot sighed. Then we are no further. Tim asked curiously. Who was it saw me? Rosalie Otterbourne. She came around from the other side of the boat and saw you leave Lynette Doyle's cabin and go to your own. So it was she who told you, Poirot said gently. Excuse me. She did not tell me. But then how do you know? Because I am Hercule Poirot. I do not need to be told. When I taxed her with it, do you know what she said? She said, I saw nobody. And she lied. But why? Poirot said in a detached voice, perhaps because she thought the man she saw was the murderer. It looked like that, you know. That seems to me all the more reason for telling you. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. She did not think so, it seems. Tim said, a queer note in his voice, she is an extraordinary sort of girl. She must have been through a pretty rough time with that mother of hers. Yes, life has not been easy for her. Poor kid, Tim muttered. Then he looked towards Race. Well, sir, uh, where do we go from here? I admit taking the pearls from Lynette's cabin. You'll find them just where you say they are. I'm guilty, all right. But as far as Miss Southwood is concerned, I'm not admitting anything. You've no evidence against her, whatever. How I got hold of that fake necklace is my own business. Poirot murmured. A very correct attitude, Tim said with a flash of humor. Always the gentleman, he added. <clears throat> Perhaps you can imagine how annoying it was to me to find my mother cottoning on to you. I'm not a sufficiently hardened criminal to enjoy sitting cheek by jowl with a successful detective just before bringing off a rather risky coup. Some people might get a kick out of it. I didn't. Frankly, it gave me cold feet. But did not deter you from making your attempt? Tim shrugged his shoulders. I couldn't funk it to that extent. The exchange had to be made sometime, and I'd got a unique opportunity on this boat. A cabin only two doors off, and Lynette herself so preoccupied with her own troubles that she wasn't likely to detect the change. I wonder if that was so. Tim looked up sharply. What do you mean? Poirot pressed the bell. I am going to ask Miss Otterborn if she will come here for a minute. Tim frowned, but said nothing. A steward came, received the order, and went away with the message. Rosalie came after a few minutes. Her eyes, reddened with recent weeping, widened a little at seeing Tim, but her old attitude of suspicion and defiance seemed entirely absent. She sat down, and with a new docility, looked from race to Poirot. "'We're very sorry to bother you, Miss Otterborn,' said race gently. He was slightly annoyed with Poirot. The girl said in a low voice, It doesn't matter. Poirot said, It is necessary to clear up one or two points. When I asked you whether you saw anyone on the starboard deck at 1.10 this morning, your answer was that you saw nobody. Fortunately, I have been able to arrive at the truth without your help. Mr. Allerton has admitted that he was in Lynette Doyle's cabin last night. She flashed a swift glance at Tim. Tim, his face grim and set, gave a curt nod. The time is correct, Mr. Allerton? Allerton replied. Quite correct. Rosalie was staring at him. Her lips trembled, fell apart. But you didn't. You didn't, he said quickly. No, I didn't kill her. I'm a thief, not a murderer. It's all going to come out, so you might as well know I was after her pearls, Poirot said. Mr. Hellerton's story is that he went to her cabin last night and exchanged a string of fake pearls for the real ones. 
Did you? said Rosalie, her eyes grave, sad, childlike, questioned his. Yes, said Tim. There was a pause. Colonel Race shifted restlessly. Poirot said in a curious voice, That, as I say, is Mr. Allerton's story, partially confirmed by your evidence. That is to say, there is evidence that he did visit Lynette Doyle's cabin last night, but there is no evidence to show why he did so. Tim stared at him. But you know. What do I know? Well, you know I've got the pearls. May we? May we? I know you have the pearls, but I do not know when you got them. It may have been before last night. You said just now that Lynette Doyle would not have noticed the substitution. I am not so sure of that. Supposing she did notice it. Supposing even she knew who did it. Supposing that last night she threatened to expose the whole business, and that you knew she meant to do so. And supposing that you overheard the scene in the saloon between Jacqueline de Belfort and Simon Doyle, and as soon as the saloon was empty you slipped in and secured the pistol. And then, an hour later, when the boat had quieted down, you crept along to Lynette Doyle's cabin and made quite sure that no exposure would come. My God, said Tim. Out of his ashen face, two tortured, agonized eyes gazed dumbly at Hercule Poirot. The latter went on. But somebody else saw you. The girl Louise. The next day she came to you and blackmailed you. You must pay her handsomely, or she would tell what she knew. You realized that to submit to blackmail would be the beginning of the end. You pretended to agree, made an appointment to come to her cabin just before lunch with the money. Then, when she was counting the notes, you stabbed her. But again, luck was against you. Somebody saw you go to her cabin. He half turned to Rosalie. Your mother. Once again you had to act, dangerously, foolhardily. But it was the only chance. You had heard Pennington talk about his revolver. He rushed into his cabin, got a hold of it, listened outside Dr. Besner's cabin door, and shot Mrs. Otterborn before she could reveal your name. N no, cried Rosalie. He didn't. He didn't. After that you did the only thing you could do, rushed around the stern, and when I rushed after you, you had turned and pretended to be coming in the opposite direction. You had handled the revolver and gloves. Those gloves were in your pocket when I asked for them, Tim said. Before God, I swear it isn't true, not a word of it. But his voice, ill-assured and trembling, failed to convince. It was then that Rosalie Otterborn surprised them. Of course it isn't true. And Monjou knows it isn't. He's saying it for some reason of his own. Poirot looked at her. A faint smile came to his lips. He spread his hands in token of surrender. Mademoiselle is too clever. But you agree it was a good case? What the devil? Tim began with rising anger, but Poirot held up a hand. There is a very good case against you, Mr. Allerton. I wanted you to realize that. Now I will tell you something more pleasant. I have not yet examined that rosary in your cabin. It may be that when I do, I shall find nothing there. And then, since Mademoiselle Otterborn sticks to it that she saw no one on the deck last night, eh bien, there is no case against you at all. The pearls were taken by a kleptomaniac who has since returned them. They are in a little box on the table by the door if you would care to examine them with Mademoiselle. Tim got up. He stood up for a moment, unable to speak. When he did, his words seemed inadequate, but it is possible that they satisfied his listeners. Thanks, he said. You won't have to give me another chance. He held the door open for the girl. She passed out, and picking up the little cardboard box, he followed her. Side by side they went. Tim opened the box, took out the sham string of pearls, and hurled it far from him into the Nile. There, he said, that's gone. When I return the box to Poirot, the real string will be in it. What a damn fool I've been. Rosalie said in a low voice, Why did you come to do it in the first place? How did I come to start, you mean? Oh, I don't know. Boredom? Laziness? The fun of the thing? Such a much more attractive way of earning a living than just pegging away at a job. Sounds pretty sordid to you, I suspect. 
But you know, there was an attraction about it, mainly the risk, I suppose. I think I understand. Yes, but you would never do it. Rosalie considered for a moment or two, her grave young head bent. No, she said simply, I wouldn't. He said, Oh, my dear, you're so lovely, so utterly lovely. Why wouldn't you say you'd seen me last night? I thought they might suspect you. Did you suspect me? No. I couldn't believe that you'd kill anyone. No. I'm not the strong stuff murderers are made of. I'm only a miserable sneak thief. She put out a timid hand and touched his arm. Don't say that. He caught her hand in his. Rosalie, would you... You know what I mean? Or would you always despise me and throw it in my teeth? She smiled faintly. There are things you could throw in my teeth, too? Rosalie, darling. But she held back a minute longer. This Joanna. Tim gave a sudden shout. Joanna? You're as bad as mother. I don't care a damn about Joanna. She's got a face like a horse and a predatory eye. A most unattractive female. Presently, Rosalie said, Your mother need never know about you. Tim said thoughtfully, I'm not sure. I think I should tell her. Mother's got plenty of stuffing, you know. She can stand up to things. Yes, I think I shall shatter her maternal illusions about me. She'll be so relieved to know that my relations with Joanna purely of a business nature that she'll forgive me everything else. I had come to Mrs. Ireton's cabin, and Tim knocked firmly on the door. It opened, and Mrs. Ireton stood on the threshold. Rosalie and I, said Tim. He paused. Oh, my dears, said Mrs. Ireton. She folded Rosalie in her arms. My dear, dear child, I always hoped, but... Tim was so tiresome and pretended he didn't like you. But of course I saw through that, Rosalie said in a broken voice. You've been so sweet to me always. I used to wish, to wish. She broke off and sobbed happily on Mrs. Allerton's shoulder. Chapter 27 As the door closed behind Tim and Rosalie, Watto looked somewhat apologetically at Colonel Race. The colonel was looking rather grim. You will consent to my little arrangement, yes? Yeah? Poirot pleaded. It is irregular. I know it is irregular, yes. But I have a higher regard for human happiness. You've none for mine, said Reyes. A ruby? I have a tenderness towards her, and she loves that young man. It will be an excellent match. She has the stiffening he needs. The mother likes her. Everything is thoroughly suitable. In fact, the marriage has been arranged by heaven and Hercule Boileau. All I have to do is to compound a felony. But, mon ami, I told you it was all conjecture on my part. Grace grinned suddenly. It's all right by me. I'm not a damn policeman, thank God. I dare say the young fool goes straight enough now. The girl's straight, all right. No, what I'm complaining of is your treatment of me. I'm a patient man, but there are limits to my patience. Do you know who committed the three murders on this boat, or don't you? I do. Then why all this beating around the bush? You think that I am just amusing myself with side issues? And it annoys you. But it is not that. Once I went professionally to an archaeological expedition, and I learned something there. In the course of an excavation, when something comes up out of the ground, everything is cleared away, very carefully, all around it. You take away the loose earth, and you scrape here and there with a knife, until finally your object is there, all alone, ready to be drawn and photographed with no extraneous matter confusing it. That is what I have been seeking to do, clear away the extraneous matter, so that we can see the truth, the naked, shining truth. Good, said Race. Let's have this naked, shining truth. It wasn't Pennington. It wasn't young Allerton. I presume it wasn't Fleetwood. Let's hear who it was for a change. My friend, I am just about to tell you. 
There was a knock on the door. Race uttered a muffled curse. It was Dr. Besner and Cornelia. The latter was looking upset. Oh, Colonel Race, she exclaimed. Miss Bowers has just told me about Cousin Marie. It's been the most dreadful shock. She said she couldn't bear the responsibility all by herself any longer, and that I'd better know as I was one of the family. I just couldn't believe it at first, but Dr. Besner here has been just wonderful. No, no, protested the doctor modestly. He's been so kind, explaining it all, and how people really can't help it. He's had kleptomaniacs in his clinic, and he's explained to me how it's very often due to a deep-seated neuroses. Cornelia repeated the words with awe. It's planted very deeply in the subconscious. Sometimes it's just some little thing that happened when you were a child, and he's cured people by getting them to think back and remember what that little thing was. Cornelia paused, drew a breath, and started off again. But it's worrying me dreadfully in case it all gets out. It would be too terrible in New York. Why, all the tabloids would have it. Cousin Marie and Mother and everybody, they'd never hold up their hands again. Grace sighed. That's all right, he said. This is Hush Hush House. I beg your pardon, Colonel Race. What I was endeavoring to say was that anything short of murder is being hushed up. Oh, Cordelia clasped her hands. I'm so relieved. I've just been worrying and worrying. You have the heart to tend, said Dr. Besner, and patted her benevolently on the shoulder. He said to the others, She has a very sensitive and beautiful nature. Oh, I haven't, really. I'm too kind. Poirot murmured. Have you seen any more of Mr. Vargas? Cordelia blushed. No, but Cousin Marie has been talking about him. It seems the young man is highly born, said Dr. Besner. I must confess he does not look it. His clothes are terrible. Not for a moment does he appear as a well-bred man. And what do you think, mademoiselle? I think he might be just plain crazy, said Cornelia. Poirot turned to the doctor. How was your patient? Ach, he's going on splendidly. I have just reassured the little Fraulein de Belvoir. Would you believe it? I found her in despair. Just because the fellow had a bit of temperature this afternoon. But what could be more natural? It is amazing that he is not alive even now. But now... He is like some of our peasants. He has a magnificent constitution, the constitution of an ox. I have seen them with deep wounds that they hardly notice. It is the same with Mr. Doyle. His pulse is steady, his temperature only slightly above normal. I was able to poo-poo the little lady's fears. All the same, it's ridiculous, nicht wahr? One minute you shoot a man, the next you are in hysterics in case he may not be doing well. Cornelia said. She loves him terribly, you see. Ah, but it is not sensible, that. If you loved a man, would you try and shoot him? No, you are sensible. I don't like things that go off with bangs anyway, said Cornelia. Naturally you do not. You are very feminine. Grace interrupted this scene of heavy approval. Since Doyle is all right, there's no reason I shouldn't come along and resume our talk this afternoon. He was just telling me about a telegram. Dr. Besner's bulk moved up and down appreciatively. Ho, oh, ho, ho. It was very funny, that. Doyle, he tells me all about it. It was a telegram all about vegetables, potatoes, artichokes, leeks. Ugh, pardon. With a stifled exclamation, Race had sat up in his chair. My God, so that's it, Rachetti. He looked round on three uncomprehending faces. A new code, it was used in the South African rebellion. Potatoes mean machine guns, artichokes are high explosives, and so on. Rachetti is no more an archaeologist than I am. He's a very dangerous agitator, a man who's killed more than once, and I'll swear that he's killed once again. Mrs. Doyle opened that telegram by mistake, you see. If she were ever to repeat what was in it before me, he knew his goose would be cooked. He turned to Poirot. Am I right? Is Rochette the man? He is your man, said Poirot. I always thought that there was something wrong about him. He was almost too word-perfect in his role. He was all archaeologist, 
not enough human being. He paused and then said, But it was not Reshetti who killed the Netoil. For some time now I have known what I may express as the first half of the murder. Now I know the second half also. The picture is complete. But you understand that although I know what must have happened, I have no proof that it happened. Intellectually, the case is satisfying. Actually, it is profoundly unsatisfactory. There is only one hope. A confession from the murderer. Dr. Besmer raised his shoulders skeptically. Ah, but that is... It would be a miracle. I think not. Not under the circumstances. Cornelia cried out. But who is it? Aren't you going to tell us? Otto's eyes ranged quietly over the three of them, Race smiling sardonically, Besner still looking skeptical, Cornelia, her mouth hanging a little open, gazing at him with eager eyes. May we? he said. I like an audience. I must confess, I am vain, you see. I am puffed up with conceit. I like to say, see how clever is Hercule Poirot. Race shifted a little in his chair. Well, he said gently, just how clever is Hercule Poirot? Shaking his head sadly from side to side, Poirot said, To begin with, I was stupid, incredibly stupid. To me, the stumbling block was the pistol, Jacqueline de Belfort's pistol. Why had that pistol not been left on the scene of the crime? The idea of the murderer was quite plainly to incriminate her. Why then did the murderer take it away? I was so stupid that I thought of all sorts of fantastic reasons. The real one was very simple. The murderer took it away because he had to take it away. Because he had no choice in the matter. Chapter 28 You and I, my friend, Poirot leaned towards Race, started our investigation with a preconceived idea. That idea was that the crime was committed on the spur of the moment, without any preliminary planning. Somebody wished to remove Lynette Doyle and had seized their opportunity to do so at the moment when the crime would almost certainly be attributed to Jacqueline de Belfort. It therefore followed that the person in question had overheard the scene between Jacqueline and Simon Doyle and had obtained possession of the pistol after the others had left the saloon. But, my friends, if that preconceived idea was wrong, the whole aspect of the case altered it. And it was wrong. This was no spontaneous crime committed on the spur of the moment. It was, on the contrary, very carefully planned and accurately timed, with all the details meticulously worked out beforehand, even to the drugging of Hercule Poirot's bottle of wine on the night in question. But yes, that is so. I was put to sleep so that there should be no possibility of my participating in the events of the night. But it just occurred to me as a possibility. I drink wine. My two companions at table drink whiskey and mineral water, respectively. Nothing easier than to slip a dose of harmless narcotic into my bottle of wine. The bottles stand on the tables all day. But I dismissed the thought. It had been a hot day. I had been unusually tired. It was not really extraordinary that I should, for once, have slept heavily instead of lightly as I usually do. You see, I was still in the grip of the preconceived idea. If I had been drugged, that would have implied premeditation. It would mean that before 7.30, when dinner was served, the crime had already been decided upon, and that, always from the point of view of the preconceived idea, was absurd. The first blow to the preconceived idea was when the pistol was recovered from the Nile. It, to begin with, if we were right in our assumptions, the pistol ought never to have been thrown overboard at all. And there was more to follow. Poirot turned to Dr. Besner. You, Dr. Besner, examined Lynette Doyle's body. You will remember that the wound showed no signs of scorching. That is to say that the pistol had been placed close against the head before being fired. Besner nodded. So, that is exact. But when the pistol was found, it was wrapped in a velvet stole, and that velvet showed definite signs that the pistol had been fired through its folds presumably under the impression that that would deaden the sound of the shot. But if the pistol had been fired through the velvet, there would have been no signs of burning on the victim's skin. Therefore, the shot fired through the stole could not have been the shot that killed Annette Doyle. 
Could it have been the other shot? The one fired by Jack de Belfort and Simon Doyle? Again, no. For there had been two witnesses of that shooting, and we knew all about it. It appeared, therefore, as though a third shot had been fired, one we knew nothing about. But only two shots had been fired from the pistol, and there was no hint or suggestion of another shot. Here we were face to face with a very curious, unexplained circumstance. The next interesting point was the fact that in Lynette Doyle's cabin I found two bottles of colored nail polish. Now ladies very often vary the color of their nails, but so far Lynette Doyle's nails had always been the shade called Cardinal, a deep, dark red. The other bottle was labeled Rose, which is a shade of pale pink, but the few drops remaining in the bottle were not pale pink, but a bright red. It, I was sufficiently curious to take out the stopper and sniff. Instead of the usual strong odor of pear drops, the bottle smelt of vinegar. That is to say, it suggested that the drop or two fluid in it was red ink. Now, there is no reason why Mrs. Doyle should not have had a bottle of red ink, but it would have been more natural if she had had the red ink in a red ink bottle, and not in a nail polish bottle. It suggested a link with the faintly stained handkerchief, which had been wrapped around the pistol. Red ink washes out quickly, but always leaves a pale pink stain. I should perhaps have arrived at the truth with these slender indications, but an event occurred which rendered all doubts superfluous. Louis Bourget was killed in circumstances which pointed unmistakably to the fact that she had been blackmailing the murderer. Not only was a fragment of a mille franc note still clasped in her hand, but I remembered some very significant words she had used this morning. Listen carefully, for here is the crux of the whole matter. When I asked her if she had seen anything the previous night, she gave this curious answer. Naturally, if I had been unable to sleep, if I had mounted the stairs, then perhaps I might have seen this assassin, this monster, enter or leave Madame's cabin. Now, what exactly did that tell us? Besner, his nose wrinkling with intellectual interest, replied promptly. It told you she had mounted the stair. No, no, you fail to see the point. Why should she have said that to us? To convey a hint. But why hint to us? If she knows who the murderer is, there are two courses open to her. To tell us the truth or to hold her tongue and demand money for her silence from the person concerned. But she does neither. She neither says promptly, I saw nobody, I was asleep, nor does she say, yes, I saw someone and it was so-and-so. Why use that significant, indeterminate rigmarole of words? Far blue, there can be only one reason. She is hinting to the murderer. Therefore, the murderer must have been present at the time. But besides myself and Colonel Reis, only two people were present, Simon Doyle and Dr. Besner. The doctor sprang up with a roar. Ah, what is that you say? You accuse me again? But it is ridiculous beneath contempt. Poirot said sharply, Be quiet. I am telling you what I thought at the time. Let us remain impersonal. He doesn't mean he thinks it's you now, said Cornelia soothingly. Poirot went on quickly. So it lay there, between Simon Doyle and Dr. Besner. But what reason has Besner to kill Annette Doyle? None, so far as I know. Simon Doyle, then? But that was impossible. There were plenty of witnesses who could swear that Doyle never left the saloon that evening until the quarrel broke out. After that he was wounded, and it would then have been physically impossible for him to do so. Had I good evidence on both these points? Yes, I had evidence of Miss Robson, of Jim Vanthorpe, and of Jacqueline de Belvoir as to the first, and I had the skilled testimony of Dr. Besner and of Miss Bowers as to the other. No doubt was possible. So Dr. Besner must be the guilty one. In favor of this theory, there was the fact that the maid had been stabbed with a surgical knife. On the other hand, Besner had deliberately called attention to this fact. And then, my friends, a second, perfectly indisputable fact became apparent to me. Louise Bourget's hint could not have been intended for Dr. Pesner, because she could perfectly well have spoken to him in private, 
at any time she liked. There was one person, and one person only, who corresponded to her necessity. Simon Doyle. Simon Doyle was wounded, was constantly attended by a doctor, was in that doctor's cabin. It was to him, therefore, that she risked saying those ambiguous words in case she might not get another chance. And I remember how she had gone on turning to him. Bonjour, I implore you. You see how it is? What can I say? And his answer, My good girl, don't be a fool. Nobody thinks you saw or heard anything. You'll be quite all right. I'll look after you. Nobody's accusing you of anything. That was the assurance she wanted. And she got it. Pesner uttered a colossal snort. Ah, it's foolish, that. Do you think a man with a fractured bone and a splint on his leg could go walking about the boat and stabbing people? I tell you, it was impossible for Simon Doyle to leave his cabin. Hoyle said gently. I know. That is quite true. The thing was impossible. It was impossible. But it was also true. There could be only one logical meaning behind Louis Bourget's words. So? I returned to the beginning, and reviewed the crime in the light of this new knowledge. Was it possible that in the period preceding the quarrel, Simon Doyle had left the saloon, and the others had forgotten or not noticed it? I could not see that that was possible. Could the skilled testimony of Dr. Pesner and Miss Powers be disregarded? Again, I felt sure it could not. But I remembered there was a gap between the two. Simon Doyle had been alone in the saloon for a period of five minutes, and the skill testimony of Dr. Pesner only applied to the time after that period. For that period we had only the evidence of visual appearance, and though apparently that was perfectly sound, it was no longer certain. What had actually been seen, leaving assumption out of the question? Miss Robson had seen Mr. Belfort fire a pistol, had seen Simon Doyle collapse onto a chair, had seen him clasp a handkerchief to his leg, and seen that handkerchief gradually soak through red. What had Mr. Fenthorpe heard and seen? He heard the shot. He found Doyle with a red-stained handkerchief clasped to his leg. What had happened then? Doyle had been very insistent that Mr. Belvoir should be got away, that she should not be left alone. After that, he suggested that Fenthorpe should get a hold of the doctor. Accordingly, Miss Robson and Mr. Fanthorpe go out with Mr. Belfort, and for the next five minutes they are busy on the port side of the deck. Miss Bowers, Dr. Besnos, and Mr. Belfort's cabins are all on the port side. Two minutes are all that Simon Doyle needs. He picked up the pistol from under the sofa, slips out of his shoes, runs like a hare silently along the starboard deck, enters his wife's cabin, creeps up to her as she lies asleep, shoots her through the head, puts the bottle that has contained the red ink on her washstand, it mustn't be found on him, runs back, gets hold of Miss Van Schuyler's velvet stool, which he has quietly stuffed down the side of a chair in readiness, muffles it around the pistol, and fires a bullet into his own leg. His chair into which he falls, in genuine agony this time, is by a window. He lifts the window and throws the pistol, wrapped up with the telltale handkerchief in the velvet stool, into the Nile. Impossible! said Reyes. No, my friend, not impossible. Remember the evidence of Tim Allerton? He heard the pop, followed by a splash, and he heard something else, the footsteps of a man running, a man running past his door, but nobody should have been running along the starboard side of the deck. What he heard was the stalking feet of Simon Doyle running past his cabin. Reyes said, I still say it's impossible. No man could work out the whole caboodle like that in a flash especially a chap like Doyle who's slow in his mental processes, but very quick and deft in his physical actions. That, yes, but he wouldn't be capable of thinking the whole thing out. But he did not think it out himself, my friend. That is where we were all wrong. It looked like a crime committed on the spur of the moment. As I say, it was a very cleverly planned and well-thought-out piece of work. It could not be chance that Simon Doyle had a bottle of red ink in his pocket. No, it must be design. It was not chance that he had a plain, unmarked handkerchief with him. It was not chance that Jacqueline de Belfort's foot kicked the pistol under the settee, where it would be out of sight, and unremembered until later. Jacqueline? 
Certainly, the two heads of the murderer. What gave Simon his alibi? The shot fired by Jacqueline. What gave Jacqueline her alibi? The insistence of Simon, which resulted in the hospital nurse remaining with her all night. There, between the two of them, you get all the qualities you require. The cool, resourceful planning brain, Jacqueline de Belfort's brain, and the man of action to carry it out with incredible swiftness and timing. Look at it the right way, and it answers every question. Simon Doyle and Jacqueline have been lovers. Realize that they are still lovers, and it is all clear. Simon does away with his rich wife, inherits her money, and in due course will marry his old love. It was all very ingenious. The persecution of Mrs. Doyle by Jacqueline, all part of the plan. Simon's pretended rage, and yet there were lapses. He held forth to me once about possessive women, held forth with real bitterness. It ought to have been clear to me that it was his wife he was thinking about, not Jacqueline. Then his manner to his wife in public. An ordinary, inarticulate Englishman such as Simon Doyle is very embarrassed of showing any affection. Simon was not really a good actor. He overdid the devoted manner. That conversation I had with Mademoiselle Jacqueline, too, when she pretended that somebody had overheard, I saw no one. And there was no one, but it was to be a useful red herring later. Then one night on this boat I thought I heard Simon and Lynette outside my cabin. He was saying... We've got to go through with it now. It was Doyle, all right. But it was to Jacqueline he was speaking. The final drama was perfectly planned and timed. There was a sleeping draft for me in case I might put an inconvenient finger in the pie. There was the selection of Miss Robson as a witness. The working up of the scene. Mr. Belfort's exaggerated remorse and hysterics. She made a good deal of noise in case the shot should be heard. In verite, it was an extraordinarily clever idea. Jacqueline says she has shot Doyle. Miss Robson says so. Van Thorpe says so. And when Simon's leg is examined, he has been shot. It looks unanswerable. For both of them, there is a perfect alibi. At the cost, it is true, of a certain amount of pain and risk to Simon Doyle, but it is necessary that his wound should definitely disable him. And then the plan goes wrong. Louise Bourget has been wakeful. She has come up the stairway, and she has seen Simon Doyle run along to his wife's cabin and come back. Easy enough to piece together what has happened the following day, and so she makes her greedy bid for hush money, and in so doing, signs her death warrant. But Mr. Doyle couldn't have killed her, Cornelia objected. No, the other partner did that murder. As soon as he could, Simon Doyle asked to see Jacqueline. He even asked me to leave them alone together. He tells her then of the new danger. They must act at once. He knows what Vesner's scalpels are kept. After the crime, the scalpel is wiped and returned, and then, very late and rather out of breath, Jack de Belvoir hurries into lunch. And still all is not well, for Mrs. Otterborn has seen Jacqueline go into Louis Bourget's cabin, and she comes hot foot to tell Simon about it. Jacqueline is the murderess. Do you remember how Simon shouted at the poor woman? Nerves, we thought, but the door was open, and he was trying to convey the danger to his accomplice. She heard, and she acted, acted like lightning. She remembered Pennington had talked about a revolver. She got hold of it, crept up outside the door, and listened, and at the critical moment, fired. She boasted once that she was a good shot, and her boast was not an idle one. I remarked after that third crime that there were three ways the murderer could have gone. I meant that he could have gone aft, in which case Tim Allerton was the criminal. He could have gone over the side, very improbable, or he could have gone into a cabin. Jacqueline's cabin was just two away from Dr. Vesner's. She had only to throw down the revolver, bolt into the cabin, ruffle her hair, and fling herself down on the bunk. It was risky, but it was the only possible chance. There was a silence. Then Race asked, what happened to the first bullet fired at door by the girl? I think it went into the table. There is a recently made hole there. I think Doyle had time to take it out with a penknife and fling it through the window. He had, of course, a spare cartridge, so that it would appear that only two shots had been fired. Cornelia sighed. They thought of everything. She said it's horrible. Poirot went silent, but it was not a modest silence. His eyes seemed to be saying... 
You are wrong. They did not allow for Hercule Poirot. Aloud, he said. And now, doctor, we will go and have a word with your patient. Chapter 29 It was very much later that evening that Hercule Poirot came and knocked on the door of the cabin. A voice said, Come in. And he entered. Jacqueline de Belfort was sitting in a chair. In another chair, close against the wall, sat the big stewardess. Jacqueline's eyes surveyed Poirot thoughtfully. She made a gesture toward the stewardess. Can she go? Poirot nodded to the woman and she went out. Poirot drew up her chair and sat down near Jacqueline. Neither of them spoke. Poirot's face was unhappy. In the end, it was the girl who spoke first. Well, it's all over. You were too clever for us, Monsieur Poirot. Poirot sighed. He spread out his hands. He seemed strangely dumb. All the same, said Jacqueline reflectively, I can't really see that you had much proof. You were quite right, of course, but if we'd bluffed you out... In no other way, mademoiselle, could the thing have happened. That's proof enough for a logical mind. But I don't believe it would have convinced a jury. Oh, well, it can't be helped. You sprang it all on Simon, and he went down like a ninepin. He lost his head utterly, poor lamb, and admitted everything. She shook her head. He's a bad loser. But you, mademoiselle, are a good loser. She laughed suddenly, a queer, gay, defiant little laugh. Oh, yes, I'm a good loser, all right. She looked at him. She said suddenly and impulsively, Don't mind so much, Mojo Parvo, about me, I mean. Do mind, don't you? Yes, mademoiselle. But it wouldn't have occurred to you to let me off. Hercule Poirot said quietly, No. She nodded her head in a quiet agreement. No, it's no use being sentimental. I might do it again. I'm not a safe person any longer. I can feel that myself. She went on broodingly. It's so dreadfully easy killing people. And to begin to feel that it doesn't matter. That it's only you that matters. It's dangerous, that. She paused, then said with a little smile, You did your best for me, you know. At night at Aswan, you told me not to open my heart to evil. Did you realize then what was in my mind? He shook his head. I only knew that what I said was true. It was true. I could have stopped then, you know. I nearly did. I could have told Simon that I wouldn't go on with it. But then, perhaps... She broke off. She said, Would you like to hear about it? From the beginning? If you care to tell me, mademoiselle, I think I want to tell you. It was all very simple, really. You see, Simon and I loved each other. It was a matter-of-fact statement, yet underneath the lightness of her tone there were echoes. Poirot said simply, And for you, love would have been enough, but not for him. You might put it that way, perhaps, but I don't quite understand, Simon. You see, he's always wanted money so dreadfully. He likes all the things you get with money. Horses and yachts and sport. Nice things, all of them. Things a man ought to be keen about. And he'd never been able to have any of them. He's awfully simple, Simon is. He wants things just like a child wants them. You know, terribly. All the same, he never tried to marry anybody rich and horrid. He wasn't that sort. And then we met, and and that sort of settled things. Only we didn't see when he'd be able to marry. He'd had a rather decent job, but he'd lost it. In a way, it was his own fault. He tried to do something smart over money and got found out at once. I don't believe he really meant to be dishonest. He just thought it was the sort of thing people did in the city. A flicker passed over her listener's face, but he guarded his tongue. There we were, up against it, and then I thought of Lynette in her new country house, and I rushed off to her. You know, Monjo Poirot, I love Lynette. 
Really, I did. She was my best friend, and I never dreamed that anything would ever come between us. I just thought how lucky it was she was rich. It might make all the difference to me and Simon if she'd given him a job. And she was awfully sweet about it, and told me to bring Simon down to see her. It was about then you saw us that night at Chez Matin. We were making whoopee, although we couldn't really afford it. She paused, sighed, then went on. What I'm going to say now is quite true, Monsieur Poirot. Even though Lynette is dead, it doesn't alter the truth. That's why I'm not really sorry about her even now. She went all out to get Simon away from me. That's the absolute truth. I don't think she even hesitated for more than about a minute. I was her friend, but she didn't care. She just went bald-headed for Simon. And Simon didn't care a damn about her. I talked a lot to you about glamour. But of course that wasn't true. He didn't want Lynette. He thought her good-looking but terribly bossy. And he hated bossy women. The whole thing embarrassed him frightfully. But he did like the thought of her money. Of course I saw that. And at last I suggested to him that it might be a good thing if he got rid of me and married Lynette. But he scouted the idea. He said money or no money, it would be hell to be married to her. He said his idea of having money was to have it himself, not to have a rich wife holding the purse strings. I'd be a kind of damn prince consort, he said to me. He said, too, that he didn't want anyone but me. I think I know when the idea came into his head. He said one day, If I had any luck, I'd marry her, and she'd die in about a year and leave me all the boodle. Then a queer, startled look came into his eyes. That was when he first thought of it. We talked about it a good deal one way or another, about how convenient it would be if Lynette died. I said it was an awful idea, and then he shut up about it. Then one day I found him reading up all about arsenic. I taxed him with it then, and he laughed and said, Nothing venture, nothing have. It's about the only time in my life I shall be near to touching a fat lot of money. After a bit, I saw that he'd made up his mind, and I was terrified, simply terrified, because, you see, I realized that he'd never pull it off. He's so childishly simple, he'd have no kind of subtlety about it, and he's got no imagination. He'd probably have just bunged arsenic into her and assumed the doctor would say she died of gastritis. He always thought things would go right. So I had to come into it, too, to look after him. She said it very simply, but in complete good faith. Poirot had no doubt whatever that her motive had been exactly what she said it was. She herself had not coveted Lynette Ridgway's money, but she had loved Simon Doyle, had loved him beyond reason and beyond rectitude and beyond pity. I thought and I thought, trying to work out a plan. It seemed to me that the basis of the idea ought to be a kind of two-handed alibi, you know. If Simon and I could somehow or other give evidence against each other, but actually that evidence would clear us of everything. It would be easy enough for me to pretend to hate Simon. It was quite a likely thing to happen under the circumstances. Then, if Lynette was killed, I should probably be suspected, so it would be better if I was suspected right away. We worked out details little by little. I wanted it to be so that if anything went wrong, they'd get me, and not Simon. That Simon was worried about me. The only thing I was glad about was that. I hadn't got to do it. I simply couldn't have. Not go along in cold blood and kill her when she was asleep. You see, I hadn't forgiven her. I think I could have killed her face to face, but not the other way. We worked everything out carefully. Even then, Simon went and wrote a J in blood, which was a silly, melodramatic thing to do. It's just the sort of thing he would think of. But it went off all right. Poirot nodded. Yes, it was not your fault that Louise Bourget could not sleep that night. And afterwards, mademoiselle? She met his eyes squarely. Yes. It's rather horrible, isn't it? I can't believe that I did that. I know now what you meant by opening your heart to evil. You know pretty well how it happened. Louise made it clear to Simon that she knew. Simon got you to bring me to him. He told me what I got to do. I wasn't even horrified. 
I was so afraid. So deadly afraid. That's what murder does to you. Simon and I were safe. Quite safe. Except for this miserable blackmailing French girl. I took her all the money we could get a hold of. I pretended to grovel. And then when she was counting the money, I did it. It was quite easy. That's what's so horribly frightening about it. It's so terribly easy. And even then we weren't safe. Mrs. Otterborn had seen me. She came triumphantly along the deck looking for you and Colonel Race. I had no time to think. I just acted like a flash. It was almost exciting. I knew it was touch or go that time. That seemed to make it better. She stopped again. Do you remember when you came into my cabin afterwards? You said you were not sure why you had come. I was so miserable, so terrified. I thought Simon was going to die. And I was hoping it, said Poirot. Jacqueline nodded. Yes, it would have been better for him that way. That was not my thought. Jacqueline looked at the sternness of his face. She said gently, Don't mind so much for me, Monsieur Poirot. After all, I've lived hard always. If we'd won out, I'd have been very happy and enjoyed things, and probably should never have regretted anything. As it is, well, one goes through with it, she added. I suppose the stewardess is in attendance to see I don't hang myself, or swallow a miraculous capsule of prussic acid like people do in books. You needn't be afraid. I shan't do that. It will be easier for Simon if I'm standing by. Poirot got up. Jacqueline rose also. She said with a sudden smile, Do you remember when I said I must follow my star? I said it might be a false star. And I said, That very bad star, that star fell down. He went on to the deck with her laughter ringing in his ears. Chapter 30 It was early dawn when they came into Shalal. The rocks came down grimly to the water's edge. Poirot murmured, Quel pas sauvage. Ray stood beside him. Well, we've done our job. I've arranged for Richetti to be taken ashore first. That we've got him. He's been a slippery customer, I can tell you. Given us the slip dozens of times. He went on. We must get hold of a stretcher for Doyle. Remarkable how he went to pieces. Not really, said Poirot. That boyish type of criminal is usually intensely vain. Once break the bubble of their self-esteem and it is finished. They go to pieces like children. Deserves to be hanged, said Reyes. He's a cold-blooded scoundrel. I'm sorry for the girl, but there's nothing to be done about it. Poirot shook his head. People say love justifies everything, but that is not true. Women who care for men like Jacqueline cares for Simon Doyle are very dangerous. It is what I said when I saw her first. She cares too much, that little one. It is true. Cornelia Robson came up beside him. Oh, she said, we're nearly in. She paused a minute or two, then said, I've been with her. With Miss de Belfort? Yes, I felt it was kind of awful for her. Boxed up with that stewardess. Cousin Marie's very angry, though, I'm afraid. Miss Van Schuyler was progressing slowly down the deck towards them. Her eyes were venomous. Cornelia, she snapped, you behaved outrageously. I shall send you straight home. Cornelia took a deep breath. I'm sorry, Cousin Marie, but I'm not going home. I'm going to get married. So you've seen sense at last, snapped the old lady. Ferguson came striding round the corner of the deck. I said, Cornelia, what's this I hear? It's not true. It's quite true, said Cornelia. I'm going to marry Dr. Besner. He asked me last night. And why are you going to marry him? said Ferguson furiously. Simply because he's rich? Oh, I'm not, said Cornelia indignantly. I like him. He's kind and he knows a lot. And I've always been interested in sick folks and clinics, and I shall have just a wonderful life with him. Do you mean to say, said Mr. Ferguson incredulously, 
that you'd rather marry that disgusting old man than me? Yes, I would. You're not reliable. You wouldn't be at all comfortable, sort of a person to live with. And he's not old, he's not fifty yet. He's got a stomach, said Mr. Ferguson venomously. Well, I've got round shoulders, said Cornelia. What one looks like doesn't matter. He says I really could help him in his work, and he's going to teach me all about neuroses. She moved away. Ferguson said to Poirot, Do you think she really means that? Certainly. She prefers that pompous old bore to me. Undoubtedly. The girl's mad, said Ferguson. Poirot's eyes twinkled. She is a woman of original mind. It is probably the first time you have met one. The boat drew into the landing stage. A cordon had been drawn round the passengers. They had been asked to wait before disembarking. Ricchetti, dark-faced and sullen, was marched ashore by two engineers. Then, after a certain amount of delay, a stretcher was brought. Simon Doyle was carried along the deck to the gangway. He looked a different man, cringing, frightened. All his boyish insouciance vanished. Jacqueline de Belvoir followed. A stewardess walked beside her. She was pale, but otherwise looked much as usual. She came up to the stretcher. Hello, Simon, she said. He looked up at her quickly. The old boyish look came back to his face for a moment. I messed it up, he said. Lost my head and admitted everything. Sorry, Jack, you've let you down. She smiled at him then. It's all right, Simon. A fool's game and we've lost, that's all. She stood aside. The bearer picked up the handles of the stretcher. Jacqueline bent down and tied the lace of her shoe. Then her hand went to her stocking top, and she straightened up with something in her hand. There was a sharp, explosive pop. Simon Doyle gave one convulsed shudder and then lay still. Jacqueline de Belfort nodded. She stood for a minute, pistol in hand. She gave a fleeting smile at Poirot. Then, as Ray's jumped forward, she turned the little glittering toy against her heart and pressed the trigger. She sank down in a soft, huddled heap. Ray shouted, Where the devil did you get that pistol? Poirot felt a hand on his arm. Mrs. Allerton said softly, You know? He nodded. She had the pair of those pistols. I realized that when I heard that one had been found in Rosalie Otterborn's handbag the day of the search. Jacqueline sat at the same table as they did. When she realized that there was going to be a search, she slipped it into the other girl's handbag. Later, she went to Rosalie's cabin and got it back after having distracted her attention with a comparison of lipsticks. As both she and her cabin had been searched yesterday, it wasn't thought necessary to do it again. Mrs. Harton said, You wanted her to take that way out? Yes, but she would not take it alone. That is why Simon Doyle has died an easier death than he deserved. Mrs. Arden shivered. Love can be a very frightening thing. That is why most great love stories are tragedies. Mrs. Arden's eyes rested upon Tim and Rosalie standing side by side in the sunlight, and she said suddenly and passionately, But thank God there is happiness in the world. As you say, madame, thank God for it. Presently, the passengers went ashore. Later, the bodies of Louise Bourget and Mrs. Otterborn were carried off to Karnak. Lastly, the body of Lynette Doyle was brought ashore. And all over the world, the wires began to hum, telling the public that Lynette Doyle, who had been Lynette Ridgway, the famous, the beautiful, the wealthy Lynette Doyle, was dead. Sir George Wode read about it in his London club, and Sterndale Rockford in New York, and Joanna Southwood in Switzerland, and it was discussed in the bar of the Three Crowns in Malton under Wode. And Mr. Burnaby's lean friend said, Well, it didn't seem fair, her having everything. And Mr. Burnaby said acutely, Well, it doesn't seem to have done her much good, poor lass. But after a while they stopped talking about her, and discussed instead who was going to win the Grand National, for, as Mr. Ferguson was saying at that minute in Luxor, it is not the past that matters, but the future. 
the end. Agatha Christie's Death on the Nile.